So this, this picture has something to do with today. There's going to be babies in Acts today. So, <laughs> so, so I scoured the internet for the cutest baby picture I could find, and there he is. Actually, it's not just babies, it's babies and mothers, so you'll, you'll have to wait for it, but it gives you something to look forward to as we, you know, venture our way through Acts, so that's what we're going to do. So where are we in Acts right now? Well, we are, we are in Acts 17, okay? That's where we're at today. We're starting 17, and, uh, and we just came out of Philippi. We've spent a long time in Philippi, and, uh, and we think, hey, Mac, is that you? No, that's somebody that just looked... <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Anyway, sorry for the distraction. Max always a distraction. So, um, uh, yeah, we left Philippi. We're leaving Philippi today. Woo! We left Philippi. And I think now you got to be a little bit of a pronoun detective, but I think based on how Luke, the author, is writing Acts, he starts to use the they word again instead of the we word. So I, I think we leave him behind in Philippi. So we're going to go forward out of Philippi, and uh, this is where we go. So now when they had passed through Amphipolis and P Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, which is today called Thessaloniki. So it's, yeah, it's the same place uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So let's take a look. Can we do a little geography? So here's our old picture of Philippi, and uh, the archaeological dig is right there on the, the left side. And we're leaving town toward the mountains. We're not going back to the ocean. You know, buckle your seatbelts. There we go. We're going inland, away from the top of the Aegean Sea and we're actually going to head west, further away from home. So here's where he goes. You'll see uh, Amphipolis show up right there, and then Apollonia shows up there, and then finally, about midway across, you'll see Thessalonica. So that's where we are today. So Paul has decided, Paul and Silas, they've left Philippi. We think they left Luke behind in Philippi, uh, and, and they've come to Thessalonica. But we do have Timothy and Silas are on board. So that's what we've got going to Thessalonica. So that's where we are today. By the the way, Thessalonica is the city name for the two letters to the Thessalonians. Ah, the Thessalonians, that's them. Those are the Thessalonians right there. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews, which Paul loves because remember, every synagogue in its Sabbath worship always has an open mic time. Sort of. I mean, they allowed someone to stand up and speak, and so Paul finds a great opportunity there to speak. So Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Three, they put up with them for three Sabbaths, and they probably said, come back next week, we'll talk about this. So for three Sabbaths, he's there reasoning from the Scriptures. And what was he reasoning? Verse 3, he was explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Messiah. <laughs> And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. Woohoo! I love how this was mentioned again as well. By the way, when you, when you talk in the Jewish community today, as it was then 2,000 years ago, it's a very contentious assertion to say that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's that. I mean, just to let you know, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. It's a it's a tough thing because there's a there's a certain understanding of who the Messiah ought to be from a Jewish perspective that Jesus doesn't fit. But Paul right here goes into the synagogue and says, well, but he does fit. Let me show you some scriptures. So that's exactly what Paul does. He reasons with them. He pulls out the scriptures. Jesus did this with the two men walking. Remember on their way, they were walking after the resurrection. So they were talking about Jesus pointing out to them from Moses and from the prophets that, yeah, he, he is the Messiah. So again, it's a contentious issue with Jews today, but it's only because uh, you don't have the broadest view of what's going on in the Old Testament about who the Messiah is. So that's exactly what Paul's doing in the synagogue. Jesus is this Messiah. And, and he had to prove to them as well that from the scriptures, the Messiah had to suffer and die. Because that's one of the contentions that Jews will say, oh, how can the kingly Messiah suffer and die? That doesn't go along with being all powerful and all that kind of stuff. Well, you can prove from the scriptures. So there it is. That's what he's doing with them. And it says he didn't just explain, but he proved it. Last time he took this approach, 
he got kicked out of town and sent out of town. So he did this very early in his ministry. He was going around proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And they basically had to say, Paul, you got to get out of town. So that was a long time ago. It was over a decade past. So anyway, so he's doing it here. And it's persuasive. It's persuasive not only just on the Jews, but it's persuasive on the Gentile Greeks as well. That's amazing. And, and a, not a few of the leading women. <laughs> so this is really, this is a great deal. And this is coming out of the synagogue. It's wonderful. But the Jews were jealous. Now, when we talk about the Jews, we're talking about the religious established authority of the Jews in town. They were jealous. So what do you do? Well, taking some wicked men of the rabble, <laughs> they formed a mob. When you can't dispute the reasonings about the Old Testament and the Messiah being Jesus, what you do is you form a mob. <laughs> I mean, it, same thing like today. If you can't dispute it, form a mob. And they set the city in an uproar, and they attacked the house of Jason, presumably where Paul and Silas were staying, seeking to bring him out to the crowd. So they went to Jason's house, because they knew that's where these guys were staying, knocked on the door and said, give us Paul and Silas to bring him outside into the crowd, into the mob. This is what we call today kind of doxing. They found out who he was staying with and they went to his house. So they wanted to bring him out. However, when they couldn't find him, which presumes it means they kind of went into the house and searched around, couldn't find him. Couldn't find him. What did they do instead? Well, they dragged Jason. <laughs> <laughs> they dragged Jason and some of his brothers, of the brothers before the city authorities. Yeah, well, you know, we can't get Paul and Silas. Let's pull Jason out because he's a collaborator. Yeah, yeah. Shouting this. Now, now, what I've done here, this is my modern mob vocabulary. So what they said, if I put it into 2022, okay, it would sound kind of like this. They would make this uh, accusation. They would say, these guys are all insurrectionists. Okay, they would say that Jason, this collaborator, he's a domestic terrorist too. He lives with us, but he's a domestic terrorist. They would say that they're actually threatening democracy. That's what's going on here. And then they would, they would say that these guys are promoting this fascist autocratic ruler. <laughs> now, if you think I'm making this up, look at what they actually said. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. That's insurrectionists. They've turned the world upside down. And Jason has received them. That makes him a domestic terrorist, because he's one of us, but he's participating with the terrorists. Uh, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar. The order that Caesar brings, they're working against that. They're bringing disorder. So that's actually the threatening democracy, you know, the order, saying that there is another King Jesus. That's the fascist authoritarian ruler. Some things sort of never change. Now, again, this is in response to the fact that Paul is doing a bang-up job discussing the Old Testament view of who the Messiah was, and, and there's no discussion here that they did any kind of refuting. Instead, they said, let's find some you know, men of low repute, let's make a mob, we'll pull them outside, we'll get everyone all worked up in a big lather, and then we'll make a false accusation about what's going on. A false accusation. It's a false accusation, except for the King Jesus. Okay, verse 8. And the people in the city authorities, well, they were disturbed when they heard these things. Because, you see, they made a good case for the fact that these guys, Paul and Silas, were disturbing the peace. And again, man, the highest value in the Roman-occupied territories was you keep the peace. And when the peace is not being kept, someone calls Rome, they send ugly soldiers, and they come and they bring the peace back by killing the people who are disturbing the peace. So peace, peace is a gigantic thing in the Roman Empire. Well, so they were disturbed about this, not only for the fact that there was this troubling going on, but they were afraid Rome would come down hard on them. This is what Rome did every single time. You come down hard, these rabble-rousers are doing this. We, we, if we don't put this out ourselves, Rome will put it out for us. Ah! So it's partially protective. They were disturbed when they heard these things. So they said, you know, we can make this all go away. Now, now I'm adding this part. This is Jim's speculation. But see, the city, authority, the city authorities have this problem. The problem is, if they don't put down this unrest, word gets to Rome, Rome will put it down in a brutal way. So the city authorities in Thessalonica say, how can we squash this? What can we do? And if you're like a, if you're a corrupt leader, you'll say, that's my corrupt leader guy. 
you know, we can make this all go away, you know? All it'll take is uh, a little money and we can make this all go away. So when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. <laughs> All it'll take is just a little bit of, come on, we can make, so we can make this go away. That's exactly what happens. So they, they basically take a public bribe and they tell Jason and their guys, we'll let you out of custody, but it's just it'll take a little bit of money. Good. Okay. So that's what they do. I, again, things just don't change. <laughs> Well, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So they figured, you know, things are too hot here in Thessalonica. Let's go to Berea. So where's Berea? Well, this, this line that I put, this is, you know, we're in the second missionary journey here. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't finish the end of that line. If you walk two days past Thessalonica, you go across this great fertile um, green plain right there. Two days later, you're in Berea. So that's where they go to. So when things get too hot in Thessalonica, let's go to Berea. So they went to Berea. So now the scene changes and we're in Berea. And when they arrived in Berea, guess what he did first? Went to the synagogue. <laughs> Very predictable. I mean, it's a great open door. It really, really is. Uh, it's a great open door. So he goes to the Jewish synagogue. And what happens? Well, now the, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. More noble? In what way? Well, they received the word with all eagerness. Remember, it, was, it took three Sabbaths in Thessalonica to get up ahead of steam. Here, it seems like it was pretty fast. They received the word with all eagerness. But most importantly, and we, this is what they're known for with us, they examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. How about that? <laughs> So not any Tom, Dick, and Harry can come into town and tell us that Jesus is the Messiah. And then he, he quotes these scriptures to us. We're going to check up on this guy. We're going to check him. Now this, I'm going to pause right here because this is, when we think about the Bereans in the New Testament, this is it. This is what we like about the Bereans is that they check up on the guys coming into town. And they look in the scriptures themselves. We have the scriptures. We can check on people. There's a great quote out of Job that I just love. Job 12, 11, Does not the ear test words as the palate it tastes food. And, and God has built this incredible safeguard system in our eating so that if you, you know, if you put something in your mouth, before you swallow it and kill yourself, when you put it in your mouth, you go, ooh, I don't think I'll, I don't think I'll swallow that. That tastes pretty bad. So it's a safeguard system where you can actually chemically test the food up here before you ingest it and kill yourself. I think that's brilliant. And that's what Job is pointing to right here. When someone brings some word to you, you need to taste it against something before you swallow it. Before you swallow it, test it. And that's the, that's the metaphor he's using right here. So that when you do find something that tastes good, you go, oh, I think I'll swallow that. New cake. So that's, a, that's the whole deal. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful safeguard system for us. Let me show you some other scriptures, because these are, these are really nice. In John 17, when Jesus is praying for the apostles, and for us by extension, they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, what's the connection to this? Well, you, if you focus on the sanctify word, sanctify is the process of pulling you out of this mucky, mire, sinful, dirty place where you get, you know, icky because of it. The sanctifying is pulling you out. The end of the sanctify process is holy, where you are actually removed from it. So if you're up to your hip in junk in this place, it would be nice to be extricated from that. It would be nice not to be dirtied by the stuff around here. And Jesus says, that's the sanctifier. So Jesus says, how does that happen? How do you keep the muck off of you? His word. His word, because his word will tell you what's muck and what's not muck, what's true and what's not true, how to discern those. And that's why that supports what he says in verse 16. They're not of the world like I'm not of the world. They're not of the mucky place. They're not of this mucky place. But I ask you that through your word that you keep them clean from the mucky place. See, so that's the separation issue from the, the fallen world. And how do you do that? His word. His word is the truth. Without that word, you cannot discern between well-intentioned secular muck and God's truth. That, that's just the way it is. And to the degree of which you are separated from God's word, you are more and more a sitting duck to what sounds like pretty good ideas, but they're really actually devilishly flawed. 
So that's why we spend so much time here doing what we do in the Word. That's why we have Bible studies, because without that, you, you are really just, you're sort of adrift. And there's some very clever, good-sounding things going around in the culture that sound... They sound Christian, they sound like Jesus, but in the end, when you test them, you go, no, actually, they're not. They're they're cleverly disguised to look like they fit when they're not. The only way you can separate them is the word, it's the truth. Another great passage, uh, when Paul talks to Timothy, his younger pastor that he's training, 2 Timothy 2.15, so do your best, Timothy, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And that rightly handling, it, it sometimes it's, it's translated divide, but it's basically, you know, looking at it well and using it to divide untruth from truth. And you you got to be in the Word to understand that. you really got to be in the Word to understand it. So that's what he's saying. That's why what we need to do is test everything, including the Pauls and Silases who just saunter into town and start saying stuff we've never heard before. And then they start quoting scriptures that we don't even remember By the way, during the time, a lot of the Jews didn't remember the passages that had to do with the suffering Messiah. So when Paul would quote from Moses or the prophets, they'd say, well, I don't think I've ever heard that because they never, so they got got to check it. They don't know if he's making it up. So they go to someone who can read and you pull out the scrolls and you read it and find out. Now, everyone didn't have a Bible to check it. So you had to sort of do a community approach to checking up on Paul. Many times the rabbis, they were literate. They could read the scrolls. There was only one scroll in the village many times. So they would say, let's go to someone who's got the book and let's unroll that baby and let's see if what Paul is quoting is accurate. And they would go over it and they'd unroll it. And they'd look and they'd go to that section and they'd go, oh, he's right. <laughs> that's the process the Bereans did. And that's the process that we should do. That's why we love the Bereans so much. Um, so really what we should be doing is scriptural fact checking. Just to use a common term again, we don't fact check quite enough when it comes to scriptural stuff. And you'll see people who make gigantic incomes and in ministries in broadcast realms of television or podcasts or something who, who act as though they're talking about Christian stuff. And it may sound really good to you on the surface, but come on, we really need, we need to do some scriptural fact checking. Just a little bit. Check up on them. See what they're saying. See if this holds water to you. It's, it's an interesting endorsement as well of the fact that God is saying to us, because he gives us his word, that you can actually fact check yourself. <laughs> you don't have to rely on experts. You can open up the word and you can fact check yourself and see if it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, you need to hold those people who are espousing that stuff sort of at an arm's length and say, well, I don't know. And even if, you know, many times Earl says, I'm not a scriptorian. Well, maybe we're not all scriptorians. I don't consider myself a scriptorian. But I ask God to lead me to places so that I can see in his word because I trust what his word says. And I trust that God has given me enough brain to read what's there and go, well... I don't know. And then hold things at arm's length. So that's what we're talking about right here. Scriptural fact checking. Love it. So you need to taste, taste what's being said, to test it with the word so you don't swallow lies. So every time you hear stuff come past you that sounds like, I've never heard this before, think of that picture of you sipping that soup and either swallowing it or not swallowing it. If it doesn't taste right up in front, don't swallow it just yet. With kids, I've never understood kids can put stuff in their mouth that is just vile to taste and they still swallow it. I don't, I don't get it. So it's actually a mature thing for you as adults. You can taste and your taster will give you a little bit of warning before you swallow something that might kill you. Just saying, just saying. I love how God designs us for that purpose. Okay, let's move on. Verse 12. Well, many of them therefore believe that therefore means they checked up and it checked out. Therefore, they believed. Woohoo! They believed. Again, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. <laughs> this time he flipped it. I love this. I love this. So here we are talking about the scriptures that these Abrians are checking up on these. They're using the Hebrew scriptures, and yet still, in all of this checkup of this fact checking the scriptures, we even have Greek women and men joining in saying, hey, look at that. Maybe what he's saying is true. Maybe this Jesus is something. Wow, look at that. This is, I, I think this is, this is just great. I, I just love this. Okay, 13. 
But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, put up a map, this is what's going on, we're over here on the left in Berea. When they hear that this is going on in Berea, they send people to Berea. <laughs> That's a two-day walk. It's a two-day walk. They say, oh, this Paul guy that we didn't like having in town here in Thessalonica, he's doing it in Berea too. Well, let's send some people and we'll counteract that. Okay, that's what we'll do. So they send a contingent. Two days walk, two days to go to Berea just to confront Paul and Silas as they're doing this discussion about Jesus being the Messiah. Oh, man. Remember when they did this before on the first tour? Do you remember that? When they, when they went up to Iconium and Lystra and stuff like that and Antioch and they got into Lystra and, they, and the people from Iconium and, and Antioch said, we need to mount a posse and go out there and oppose this guy. And they did that. They, they went, I mean, they went all across. It's, it's crazy stuff. Okay, so they were agitating and stirring up the crowds, probably the same way, the same arguments they were using before. Okay, insurrectionists. Spiritual insurrectionists. Okay, so they're agitating and stirring up the crowds. And then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, so leaf town. But Silas and Timothy remained there at Berea. They stayed there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. So basically the heat comes up in Berea because of the Thessalonians. They came over and sent a contingent to cause trouble over there. And so the brothers say, well, Paul, I guess your time here is done. Let's put you in a boat and send you away. <laughs> so they put him in a boat, but they send him to Athens to Athens. To Athens. Now, let you you go and have an appreciation of how far that is. Whoops, go back. <laughs> until until we actually travel there. So he leaves Berea. He he goes down to the coast. He gets on a boat, oh, and he goes way. This is a very established sea route from the north to the south, all the way down to Athens. That was a long trip. <laughs> He completely stepped over everyone in Upper Macedonia and down in Greece. And uh, we're going to zero in on Athens because we're going to come into Athens and talk some more there. Athens is actually, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily old city, you know. It's been, it's been there a long time, uh, populated for a long time. Today, it's, it's the largest one in all of Greece. But when you, look, when you zoom in on this section right here where Athens is, it's a nice broad plain with mountains on each side that have, you know, streams coming in to water it in the center. So it's, it's highly populated. But when I draw the yellow path where Paul went, I draw it to the center of town rather than the edge of town. Because in the center of town, there's an interesting geologic outcropping in the middle of town, this rock that comes up in the middle of this plain. And on that rock is something you might recognize. <laughs> yeah, this thing, this outcropping of rock is the Acropolis. Acro for high, polis for city. It's the high part of the city. And on top of the Acropolis is a very famous structure, an old temple called the Parthenon. So that's, that's why we, that's actually the center of town at that time, and to some degree even today. The Acropolis there in the center, it's very unusual when you see that plain that Athens is on, big broad plain. You look across it and then there's, just, there's this thing in the middle. <laughs> so for a long time, for many, many generations, they looked at that as a spiritual place because ancient civilizations looked at high places as being spiritual places. In the, in the Old Testament, when we talk about the Northern Kingdom pulling away from the Southern Kingdom in Israel, they built spiritual places on the high places. So this is one of those. And it's been like that for a long time, a long time. So that's where we're going to. So we're going to switch our context there. So uh, they get to Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So there were, there were guys that went with him. See, the brothers, they, they conducted with Paul. So a couple of, we don't know how many, some folks from Berea, said, Paul, you need to get out of the town. Let's put you in a boat. We'll show you the way. They walk them down to the coast. They get into a boat. And together with just Paul, Paul and these brothers from Berea, they sail all the way down to Athens. Once they get down to Athens and Paul's kind of settled down there, Paul doesn't let him leave until he says, when you go back to Berea, right, where Ty Timothy and Silas are, tell them to come as soon as possible. So they leave Paul all by his lonesome in Athens. And now Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy to come down and join him. By the way, again, Luke isn't mentioned in the group. Luke joined him at Troas, but he's not mentioned here. And uh, again, when you, do the, when you do the pronoun search, there's no we's in this section of the travel. It looks like, looks like Luke stayed behind in Philippi. Because when we get to the third Jesus tour, 
and they get to Philippi again, Luke shows up again. Ah. So it's interesting as they kind of move their way around. It looks like they left Luke in Philippi. Paul goes down to Athens. He leaves, he leaves Silas and Timothy and up, up in Berea. And then Paul sends word back saying, you know, as soon as you get back to Berea, tell, tell the boys to come down and meet me as soon as they can. So now Paul's got this time to kill while he's in Athens. And that's where our context moves to right now. So while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. And this provoked isn't like a, I'm provoked. It's not an angry response, but it's, but it's something that he responded to and, and felt like, wow, this is, this is a great sadness to me, what's going on in this city. All these idols, all these idols, a city full of idols. So he reasoned like he had done before in Thessalonica and Berea. He reasoned partially in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. The devout person just means a religious person who kind of hangs on with the Jewish community in the synagogue and also in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So he used any place he could find people and wanted to talk to them about Jesus and talk to them about this idol thing. I mean, what is it with all the idols here? Well, I don't know. So he does engage people. He doesn't wait for Timothy and Silas. He, he engages. <laughs> I like the fact that he engages in the synagogue because it's presumed in a synagogue you're going to have spiritual discussions. It's, it's nice to be able to go into a place where there's a collection of people and you're not going to talk about the weather or, you know, what's wrong with my cow. You're going to talk about spiritual things. In the marketplace, you're going to talk about marketplace stuff. So Paul says, that's okay. Marketplace stuff. What's the price of broccoli today? I don't care. I don't eat broccoli. But he can go in the marketplace and he can do his thing in the marketplace where people are collected. And I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Like, what do you do when someone's trying to figure out whether to buy this guy's onions or not? You know? Well, you know, the kingdom of God is sort of like an onion. You know, you appeal. I don't know. I don't know what he would say. So, but anyway, he, he's engaging people in a place where they don't normally engage about Jesus. That's the interesting thing. And we can indeed engage with people about Jesus in places where it's not part of the normal chatter. That's what's fascinating about it. Um, okay. Well, verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with them. <laughs> you mean like chefs? Epicureans? Mm, no, 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 not that kind of chefs. Epicureans. It, it's a, it, those are two flavors of actually philosophy. Because, you know, if someone asks you, what city in the world is identified with philosophy? You'd say Athens, Greece. Every single time. Athens, Greece. Man, that's the place of Aristotle. Before him, Plato. And when you go down the whole list, these are very famous, world-famous philosophers. And the Epicureans are one flavor of philosophy. The Stoics are another flavor of philosophy. So when, he, when, when uh, Luke writes right here there were Epicureans and Stoics, he's saying there were professional philosophers. People who actually get paid and spend their entire day debating philosophy of religion. So this is an interesting context because now Paul is coming into town and he's going to tangle for the very first time with philosophy pros. Will the gospel stand up with the philosophy pros? This is a whole different ball game. This is a whole different ball game than anything Paul's been in up to this point. So there were Epicureans and Stoics right there. If you're curious, you can find out what they believed. It's Eh, crazy. But, you know, they, they conversed with them. They conversed with them because that's what they did in Athens. And some said, well, what does this babbler wish to say? And then others says, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. And why? Well, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So he was making tracks in town before Timothy and Silas got there, telling people that Jesus is the Messiah and he died and he came back to life. <laughs> And so, so the, the, the pro-philosophers are going, what? We've never heard any. This is like crazy talk. And in fact, you look at a lot of the spiritual philosophies of Greece, there's nothing quite like someone dying and coming back to life again. I mean, that's, it's just, it's different. So the, the Athenian philosophers are very curious. So what do they do? Well, they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus. The Areopagus? Yeah, actually, you can take that word in half. Uh, their, their god of war was Ares. Pagus means hill. So it's 
Ares Hill. Or if you use the Roman equivalent for the Greek gods, the Roman god of war is Mars. So many times in older translations, this would be not translated, transliterated Areopagus, it would say Mars Hill. But it's the same thing. It was a hill that was dedicated to the god of war. So they take him to the Areopagus because it's actually a place where these discussions went on all the time. So let's go to the Areopagus. Where is the Areopagus? Well, there's the Acropolis. If we rotate around a little bit here, see that rock coming in your view on the left? It's a lower, but it's an outcropping, and it's coming on the bottom of the screen. That rock cropping, outcropping that's lower than the Acropolis is the Areopagus. That's the Areopagus. So that's the little place where they brought him to because that's where outdoor discussions of a large nature, they would go there rather than up on the temple site up there on the Parthenon. They would come down to here and then have their large kind of municipal discussions and debates right there. That was the place you went to debate stuff. So they took him to the Acropolis. Uh, and he's in full view of the Parthenon, by the way, the whole time of what he's going to do in the, on the Areopagus. They take him there and said, you need to tell us what this is all about. So they took him there, brought him to the Areopagus saying, well, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Ah, curious guys. Now, by the way, they probably would not have asked him to do this if he hadn't been very public about talking about the fact that Jesus died and resurrected again. And many times we, we hold back when we talk about that in strange contexts or public contexts because we think, well, I just kind of think I'm crazy. But it was because he just laid it right out there that they said, okay, we got to know more. And they, and they invited him to speak. I think this is hilarious. They invited him to speak because this is what they did. And he explains it here. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, they'd spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. <laughs> So they said, oh, let's go up to the Areopagus, tell us everything you know, because man, this is new stuff to us. But again, it was triggered because Paul was so forthright about the simplicity of the gospel. And I, and I have to tell you, that's, that's our strategy as well, too. And the places in the laundromats and the marketplaces and all the places where you go where Jesus isn't normally discussed, you know, many times the best approach is just to lay something out and say, ba-doom, and say, you got any interest in that? Hey, did you know that Jesus died and was raised again? Well, I've heard that. So you're skeptical. Well, yeah, I mean, who can raise from the dead? After all, it'd take a miracle. Well, exactly. I mean, so you can go places. It, it's usually a bad philosophy. It's a bad tactic to cover up the simplicity of the gospel up in front. Many times what will happen is it'll trigger a curiosity in someone's head. and They'll say, well, I'd like to hear more about that. But if you skirt around it, waiting for them to kind of pull it out of you, you'll never get an invitation to the Areopagus. So Paul just laid it out. He just laid it out. So they've invited him to do this big presentation. Wow. And we're not going to look at it today. <laughs> wow. You can read ahead yourself. We're going to save that for next week. In fact, we looked at this presentation last summer in the park. I did a quick message on it. So we're going to return to that and look at it again because it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating sermon. Remember last week we had one of the best sermons in Acts where the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they say, well, believe in the Lord Jesus and uh, you'll be saved, you and your family. Well, that's the shortest, that's the shortest sermon in all of Acts. He'll do a slightly longer sermon here, but what's interesting is, and you can, you, can, you can think about this, what's interesting is, what do you do when you put together what you're gonna say, when you know that in the crowd are professional Greek philosophers? What do you say? What do, you, what do you say that's different? What do, what, do you, what do you say? I mean, it's a gigantic challenge. And so when we get to what he says, and you look at it knowing he's talking to professional philosophers, what he says for me is mind-blowing. It, it's, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant. And of course, this brilliance, it comes from the Holy Spirit. But what he says here when he talks to these professional guys in the Areopagus is unlike anything else he'll ever say in any other context. It's really cool. So you can look ahead, but I mean, you know, don't spoil the surprise. It's really pretty cool. Okay, so let's make a couple of comments and then we're going to quit on this. Again, we looked at the narrative and now let's make some observations about what we saw there that might apply to us. Like for instance, uh, reasoning from the Bible about Jesus is really okay. <laughs> you can reason with people about who Jesus is. 
Uh, many times we are intimidated in the context of who we talk to and we think, well, I'm not sure I can reason with them because I think they're smarter than me. You know, you don't have to gauge whether you're smarter than someone else when you do your reasoning about who Jesus is. Again, it can just, it can just start with the fact. You can just, just say what you believe. Well, Jesus is the Messiah promised for the Jews, and he died and rose again, saved us from our sins. So there you go. What do you think of that? <laughs> and, of course, for everybody, they'll say, well, I don't go for that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things there we've got to talk about before I just believe that, you know. But at that point, you can turn on the reasoning phase. Well, what, what about that is, you know, right? Well, I'm not really sure that Jesus was a real person that lived and died. I mean, I, I mean he was probably just a myth made up by people. Very popular. I've had this. I, I think he's, you know, I'm, I'm not sure he's really a historical person. You don't think he's a historical person? Nah, nah. Well, can I show you some things that show that even outside the Bible he's a historical person? Well, I guess so. So this is the reasoning process. And, and there is as much listening as there is talking when you reason with somebody. But you can reason about who Jesus is. And by the way, I've mentioned this before. One of, one of the most profound reasoning points about the reality of the historical Jesus is what happened in the Eastern Mediterranean in the next several generations. I mean, there was a Jesus explosion. <laughs> in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then it spread all over the world. And it was such a cultural tidal wave that eventually, within you know four or five generations, there were buildings that were dedicated to Jesus, there was artwork that was dedicated to Jesus. I mean, it culturally, it sort of took over that part of the world. And by the time you get to the 300s, you know, what uh, Rome, it actually becomes accepted as an official religion of Rome. I mean, it, it, it was a tidal wave. How can a man that never existed cause that kind of a tidal wave? I mean, really. Uh, unless, unless you can come up with an equivalent explanation for how that happened, you got to have someone like Jesus or on the stature of Jesus who really was there who caused the tidal wave. So again, it's, you, know, you, could, you could work through this. This is the reasoning part. So you can reason with people, by the way, not sure you're going to be able to win the argument because it's not about winning the argument. It's about actually answering objections to what you believe and, and looking at them a little at a time. And I often get to a point in the reasoning process where someone asks a really good question. I go, oh, wow. I'm not sure I've ever thought about that before. You know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I'd love to find out. Can we get back together again after I find out the answer to your question? Well, sure. Because then they know you're not a know-it-all. They know you're not just believing stuff that you don't want to actually have qualified in fact. I want to qualify this fact and see what I find out. Are you interested in getting back together again? We can talk about what I find. Well, sure. That's reasoning. You don't have to be a know-it-all. You don't have to be smarter than people you're talking to. And in the process of reasoning about who Jesus is, many times something will connect with a hunger or curiosity people have if you just lay it out there and then follow up with objections. So anyway, so reasoning is actually okay. Reasoning's okay. Um, I, I mention this here because there, there, are, there is some people who say that people can never be reasoned into the kingdom. And there's some truth to that. That is, you can't actually twist someone's arm through logical reasoning and force them into the kingdom. And that's true. And we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is actually addressing unique individual objections or ignorances about what the gospel is all about. That's the reasoning part and adapting that process to their need. Not talking about, I'm going to give you a rock solid argument and you'll be forced to accept who Jesus is. Ah, ah, and you'll have to say, uncle, by giving your life to Jesus. Ah. No, that doesn't work. So again, but, but reasoning does have a place. That's all I want to put here. It, it really does have a place. A really good place. Um, so what happened as a result of that reasoning? Well, the Holy Spirit used that to bring Jews and leading women and devout Greeks to the Lord, which is fascinating because they're not, they don't all share the same religious background. So that's kind of cool. <clears throat> also, many times opposition to the gospel cannot counter the reasoning. And I mentioned that because, remember, what they did was they said, well, we can't counter your arguments. So what we need to do instead is uh, we'll make a crowd. We're jealous of the power and the influence you're having with people. Uh, we'll get the crowd. We'll turn them into mobs. And then as a result, we'll actually dox your local supporters. We'll find out where they live and we'll make life hard for them. That's currently what present doxing means. 
will find out where you live and make life hard for you. And that's what they did to Jason. So often in the discussions, you have to have your antennas up for this. When you're reasoning about who Jesus is, talking about the facts that are there, you'll many times for people who don't want to believe and they feel like they're getting to the threshold of being forced to believe, they cannot counter your arguments. So they'll do something different as an end around. And for them in this particular case, it was raising a mob of people and, and inciting riot. <laughs> many times, personally, people will incite a riot against you. When you get to a point where they, the, the reasoning is sound, but they still don't wanna believe. And it comes down to the issue of not wanting to believe. There is a point at which, when I talk to people about who Jesus is, I can press a point pretty far and talk about the facts that are behind it, and, uh, and you see a frustration starting to build. And when you see that frustration starting to build because they can't, they can't mount a good defense against that, instead they just get defensive and they redirect and do something else. Normally what they do is they start calling you names. Some things never change, because that's what goes on in current culture right now as well. Is just start calling you names. Well, yeah. So, so, but don't get worried by that. But I just want to say is that when, when that kind of opposition came up for Paul twice here in today's travels, he left town. So many times when you get up to this point where the reasoning is not being real productive anymore and you start getting this, the weird pushback, that's when you just need to sort of back off. That's what you do. And that's what Paul did. So um, anyway, uh, the Bereans, let's turn to the Bereans. They eagerly received the word and they tested it. There really is no replacement for you taking the word and using that to test what people say. And these days uh, on the internet, since not everything is true on the internet, <laughs> Maybe most of the things are, I don't know, but there's a lot of, you need to test what's on the internet. And there is some very good stuff on the internet. There really is. Um, Dorothy and I have a podcast we do. It says. <laughs> no, but shameless promotion. But there, there is some very good stuff. But even the stuff that sounds good, you got to test it. You really do. And the word of God is how you test it. That's your anchor against all the crazy waves of nonsense that go around. Many times we think we're smart enough to be able to spot the nonsense. And a large, a large amount of it you can. you can. You can spot the nonsense. Sometimes, boy, you know, it is, it is so carefully designed. It's such a good counterfeit. You got you to be a much more applied when you take the word and try and figure out what's going on. So, and by the way, it's a good thing too if you have friends uh, who are believers to say, you know, I heard this guy say uh, on this podcast, and he said this, do you know anything about that? Do you know any scriptures we can look at on that? You know, I don't know, what, where do I look even? So the body itself is a great resource in terms of just discussing this stuff and saying, you know, it sounds right, but uh, something's, what do you think? And so you kind of pull your knowledge together and you know, look for passages. So it works fine. It works. The Brians, they tested everything. Yay. And by the way, I might mention as well, if you, if you were Paul and you were a proud Pharisee Paul, which he's not at this point. He's kind of left that life behind. But if he were still a proud Pharisee Paul and he came into town and he read him the right act about Jesus is the Messiah and they said... Well, I think we need to check up on your passages. If he was a proud Pharisee, he'd go, No, you don't. Why don't you believe me? I've got authority and power. What's wrong with you? And you don't see Paul react like that at all. In fact, instead, what you see is they praise the Bereans because they checked up on him. It's a, it's a really good figure of merit when someone's saying something to you and you say, I'd sort of like to check up on that. If they get angry, walk away. <laughs> That's just a really great, that's a really great indicator. If they get angry, they feel like you've offended them. You feel like you don't respect their authority. But if they say, yeah, great, check me up. Look, look, tell me what you come up with. Because I'd love to see what you find out as well. That, those are so two radically different attitudes that they're just easy sociological indicators about who's telling the truth and who's not. So just, just want to say that's, that's an interesting thing. Okay, also... The gospel can indeed withstand professional philosophers. <laughs> if it's true, it should be able to withstand that kind of investigation. 
It really, really should. Now, not all of Athens comes to Jesus after all this stuff, but there, there is some success, and we'll see that next week as we take a look at exactly what, how Paul adapted the gospel message for people in Athens. But, um, but it can withstand that. And I think, again, for many of us, we think, well, you know, if I was smarter, if I had more training in apologetics, I could probably get into these, you know, really heady conversations with people who are really smart, and I, and I could win these conversations. Well, yes and no. What's really different about your stance and your equipping as opposed to those people is that you've got the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit many times steers you in a discussion direction that going into the conversation, you wouldn't suspect you'd do. And that's because the Holy Spirit knows where their need is and will probably, not probably, but many times guide you into a need spot of what they need to hear. So you don't have to be a gigantic apologist. Apologists are really valuable and I love them. There's some that I follow a lot because they've thought through a lot of issues I just never have thought through before. And those can come in handy in those situations. But you're not at a disadvantage if you're not, you know, a Mensa holding apologist. <laughs> You're not at a disadvantage because the Holy Spirit will bring you to speak what that person needs to hear. So don't, don't get too put off by this right here. Withstand modern philosophers. And many times their first response will not be favorable. <laughs> They'll call you a babbler. Well, what are these babblers saying? You're just babbling on about stuff I don't understand. Strange things. Yes, strange things. But what it does bring is an opportunity because they're always interested in hearing something new. And there's a lot of people who are like that, who are just generally curious. And I, and I mentioned this before, my, when I get on an airplane and you sit next to somebody on an airplane you don't know, you know, there's always that awkward moment as you're getting ready to take off where you do this, you know, this uh, small talk, hey, well, hey, where are you going? Oh, I'm going the same place you are, we're in the same plane. Oh, yeah, that's right. But now then, uh, well, what do you do for a living? Well, uh, I do this, you know, I sell potato chips. And what do you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I have this awkward comment because you know that as soon as I say pastor, they're going to go, oh, well. So I try and skirt around that for a while. Uh, that's just stupid me, self-conscious. However, when it gets to that point in the conversation, my go-to line is almost always, so you got any interest in spiritual things? Any interest in spiritual things? And if they say, no, I go, okay, fine. Have a great flight. Put on my headphones. <laughs> but if they say, well, yeah, some, a little bit. Well, like what kind of stuff, what kind of spiritual stuff are you interested in? Well, I'm interested in this crystal stuff, you know, where they use these crystals and, you know, you swing them over your head and man, I get healthier. Uh, and you call that, you know, you can actually go interesting places in conversation it, it, to the degree to which they let you. So that's what I'm saying in this particular thing. There's an opportunity that's waiting for you there and you don't exactly know what the door is going to look like for that opportunity. <laughs> Wow, we should all go downstairs. <laughs> Actually, we, we'll see that next week. They're taking pictures for us next week. I'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so, so th there are opportunities that the Holy Spirit can lead you to with people, but find out what those opportunities are. Sharing the gospel always starts with listening and continues to advance in discussions through listening. So that's all I'm saying. There are opportunities uh, with professional philosophers and people who think they got everything together, so... It's okay. So we, we can learn from Paul what he does in these particular interactions. <laughs> so did you see the baby? Because we're done. As important as all of that is what we hear and what we taste, with, with Satan, the great deceiver, I think it was Paul yeah. that said, hold every thought captive. Yeah, hold every thought we captive. We really have to accept right. our own thoughts. Yeah, the, it, Paul says, hold every thought captive. Uh, and the Bereans are held up many times as a great, great thing. There is a real sense which the gospel, uh, not a real sense, there's a profound sense that foundation of the gospel starts with reasoning. Because we talked last week about how faith comes from hearing, hearing and the reasoning is based on a foundation. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a gigantic amount of the gospel that actually starts with reasoning and starts with the brain and starts with facts. It, it's always like that. However, in the non-Christian world, in the secular world, uh, they have a misunderstanding that, that faith communities believe things against facts. You know, faith without facts. Blind faith in that sense. Oh, we believe all this stuff just because we want to. Yeah, well, that's not very scientific. Eh. So there's this idea that we believe in despite facts. 
Biblically, we believe because of facts. We hear facts, we reason. The word faith actually comes from the word that means to be persuaded. We are persuaded. And then something happens with the Holy Spirit and we embrace that truth. And then we not only embrace that truth, but we expect something to happen because of that truth. That's what faith is all about. So, so in a real sense, people who will have the misconception that you believe what you believe without any foundation, you need to correct that and say, no, actually we have great foundation. You probably never heard that, have you? Well, yeah, like what kind of foundation? Well, let's talk about stuff. So that's just, that's something you'll come across. Oh, so the baby, so did, you, did you see the baby? You didn't, I'm kind of fooling you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll show you, the baby's there. So when we go back to Thessalonica, there is the rest of the story about Thessalonica and it comes from one of the letters to the Thessalonians, yeah. Which is this is what's fun about this. We just got bare, bo bare bones news about Thessalonica, what happened there. But when Paul writes the Thessalonians, you get a little behind the scenes stuff. It's really kind of cool. And here's here's one of them. We'll quit with this. First Thessalonians two five. We never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have, we could have made demands as apostles of the Messiah, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. The baby is the Thessalonians, taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you'd become very dear to us. A touching kind of warm view, because when you look at this, we're, we've been talking about reasoning the gospel. There is no reasoning of the gospel that doesn't also need from you a personal involvement. We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, that's the reasoning part, but also our own selves. The gospel doesn't reason in other people's brains unless you share yourself in the process. That, that's just the way it works. And uh, how you came to the Lord and you heard the gospel through someone else, it was also the fact that they were willing to give themselves to you in the process of talking about the gospel, right? So this is a big deal. I didn't want to get too heavy on just the reasoning and the professional philosophers and all that kind of, you know, apologetics kind of stuff without remembering the fact that Paul says himself, when we came to you, we loved you and we treated you like a mother and a child. It, we were tender and we just stayed with you. We stayed with you. That's, that's actually how the gospel is shared. It's shared because you share your life with people that you share the facts of the gospel with. And that's what does it. And we'll quit with that. So, if you want to sneak ahead and see what Paul does on his message, it's next. <laughs> so you can wait till next week and sit on pins and needles all week long, or you can sneak a look yourself. You, you can do that. I won't know. Um, okay. All right, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this tremendous story in Acts. We thank you for the encouragement it is to see how your spirit moves through Paul and Silas and these guys and, and how, uh, how the gospel makes inroads in totally unexpected ways uh, in communities, not only just for the Jews, but for the, for the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, the women. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an astonishing history about how you push through with the news about who this Jesus is as Messiah and how people found life in him as a result of Paul and Silas speaking very simple truths in faraway places. So, and Lord, as we, as we connect it to us, you put us here in this faraway place. And we pray that through our lives shared and through our words spoken, that you would glorify yourself and you would uh, bring to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death an understanding of the promise and how good the good news is about who Jesus is. And what you promise to us is a God who loves us beyond measure and call us to yourself. So Lord, use us in this place to do that very thing. Take care of our anxieties about not being super intellectuals and talking in funny places and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Lord, just make us us and through your spirit, allow us to speak truth that people are hungry to hear. So we're yours now and delighted to be called yours and to speak these simple truths about this glorious God who called us to himself and who gives us life. So thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen.